The partner Bonsle is business cluster head, premium and FTA GEC channels at Z Entertainment Enterprises Limited. Aparna will introduce the speakers, and this session is presented by And Privé HD. Please join me in welcoming Aparna Bonsle. Good afternoon, and welcome to the special event that is dedicated to two of my most favorite topics, which is books and movies. Over time, there have been many lively debates on when, you know, books are made into films, whether cinema can truly do justice to the written word. I personally believe that these films are an apt homage to the original literary work. Whilst imagination knows no bounds, vivid visuals almost allow you to experience the story when it brings the characters to life. A beautiful confluence of sights and sounds, these movies actually allow you to feel the other side of the story when they bring the finely crafted words of the author, it allows it actually to transcend from paper to the screen. Capturing the themes and nuances of the original literary work, when books become films, they actually give a face to the characters that we so dearly love. Fascinated by their favorite stories, there have been a lot of filmmakers who have taken stories of their favorite authors and made amazing films over time. Some of the most admired classics, in fact, some of the very loved classics in cinema history have been based on books. Um, whether it is, uh, you know, stories like Gone with the Wind, My Fair Lady, Wuthering Heights, or even The Godfather. Just like these adaptations allow you to f almost feel the story in a different manner, our newly launched premium English entertainment channel and Privé HD allows film connoisseurs to actually feel movies. We've curated a beautiful library for them and we made sure that we had quite a few adaptations from political dramas like The Manchurian Candidate um, to uh, romantic dramas um, like um, oh, one day, we have quite a few movies to offer them. Talking about prose to screenplay, today we have an amazingly fabulous panel with us who will add insights from their point of view to this subject. They are accomplished um, authors, filmmakers, screenwriters who will bring elements of their own experiences and add further to this topic. Please join me in welcoming Amy Tan, an award-winning author whose book, The Joy Luck Club, a story about Chinese immigrant families in San Francisco, was adapted into a feature in 1993. Michael Ondaatje, a Booker Prize winning poet, novelist, editor, and filmmaker. His internationally successful novel, The English Patient, was adapted into a film in 1992. Mira Nair, an internationally acclaimed filmmaker who brought Jumpa Larry's novel The Namesake to Life on screen. Nicholas Shakespeare, described by the Wall Street Journal as one of the best English novelists of our time. His novel, The Dancer Upstairs, was made into a film for which he wrote the screen frame. Tom Stoppard, an Academy and Tony Award winning playwright. He won the Oscar for his screenplay for the film Shakespeare in Love. I would also like to welcome the moderator for the session, renowned publisher Chiki Sarkar. Please put your hands together for these eminent personalities as they commence their discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and for the slight delay in this event. 
Um, the people I'm sitting with are all known to you. They're some of the most uh, wonderful writers and directors in the world today. I'm going to simply introduce them in terms of today's talk, which is about adaptations, rather than all their work that they've ever done. So I'll start with my left. Uh, Michael Ondaatje is the author of the Booker Prize winning book, in The English Patient, which was then turned into an Oscar-winning, highly acclaimed film by Anthony Mangella, but he is also uh, a, a director of documentaries, uh, one or two, Mike, two documentaries, and he's written uh, kind of one of the great classics about film, uh, a book of conversations between him and the editor, Walter Murch. Mira Nair, again, needs no introduction, but I'm gonna mention three films that she's done based on books. Uh, namesake, Reluctant Fundamentalist, Vanity Fair. Mira, have I missed out another adaptation you've done? I think not. Uh, to my right is Tom Stoppard, uh, who is, of course, one of our greatest playwrights, but also uh, the scriptwriter for Russia House, Enigma, uh, and most recently he's adapted Ford Maddox Ford's Parade's End for television. And his own play, Rosencrantz and Gilderstone, is dead. Um, Amy Tan adapted Joy Luck Club into a highly acclaimed film. Uh, and Nicholas adapted his novel, The Dance Upstairs, for another highly acclaimed film, uh, which was John Malkovich's directorial debut, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to start by asking uh, a very, very simple question to every one of these fantastic people, which is, what does it mean for a film to be a good adaptation of a novel? What does that even mean? And uh, just to enlarge it a little bit, does it mean that it has to be faithful to the book? Or does it mean that it has to just be a good film? Uh, Michael, what do you think? Well, the, the film editor Walter Murch said, the way to make a film out of a novel is to find the short story within it which may or may not be true. Michael, I was going to quote that line, but anyway. Anyway, so the idea of you have to simplify a, a large novel into that sense of a short story. The plot has to be simpler. It has to be, can, it cannot be as complex as a book. And so I just want to check that the audience right at the end is able to hear Michael. No, Michael, I think you have to scream no? into your mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else? Okay. So anyway, I, I know that when they did The English Patient, one of the interesting things was to see how they had to simplify certain elements. And one of the most obvious things that happened was that Anthony Minghella said, it has to be chronological. So the love story, for instance, between the two main lovers, which was not chronological in the book, and I would not want it to be chronological in the book, had to be chronological when they made the film. Otherwise, the audience gets, gets lost. Was this after they first made love or after or what? So I think that kind of simplification is necessary. But, you know, there are great films that are not simple. So I, I want to go back to that question. So could you have a film that was adapted from a novel uh, where the film was just a fab film and no one worried about what the underlying novel was under it, Mira, I mean, when you were adapting namesake, reluctant fundamentalist, Vanity Fair, were you thinking, oh, I have to do justice to these fabulous authors, or I have to make a film that just works? Incidentally, I'm using material from some other people. Well, when I'm attracted to a book, like the namesake, uh, it was a visceral kind of reaction, because when I read Jumpa's book, I felt like the solace I was going, I felt I had a sister in the world who understood what it was like to bury a parent in a country that was not her home. And I had just gone through that. So when I read the namesake, I firstly felt that sense of solidarity with this writer, whom I didn't know at the time, Jumpa. But the book is actually in several chapters, in three chapters, but I wanted to tell the tale. And you, to answer your earlier question to Michael, you have to have, as a director, a point of view. You, know, you have to cut a swath through the material 
with that point of view while retaining, I hope, and I always want to retain a spirit of that novel, of that story that spoke to me in the first place. So with the, with the namesake, it was for me much more about the parents, Ashima and Ashok Ganguly, than it was about Gogol, their son. Um, in the book is almost more than half about Gogol. But for me, because of my personal experience, I wanted to speak of what I called old shoe love, you know, the, the love story between our parents in that generation that you never see in screen. And, 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 and so my point of view was the parents and the fact that they were strangers, they fell in love in a foreign country, and they produced a child who was unknown to them almost. She was an American, and that balance. So I want to ask both Michael and Mira. Uh, Mira, did Chumpa, when you told her that, you know, I'm going to take 50% of your novel, compress it in, I'm, I'm now exaggerating, but I'll compress it real tight, I'm gonna take the other part and then just make it really long. Michael, when Anthony said, you know, I'm gonna take this very part of the art of English patient was the, the, the way it was narrated. Uh, you know, so this, this kind of incredible hard work that you put into the, the, the structure of the novel was now gonna be untangled and made simpler. Did, did uh, Jhumpa in your case, uh, Michael in your case, did you guys feel, gosh, you're kind of mauling my book, I'm really upset? No, because when, firstly, Jhumpa, you know, really was happy that I had called her about this. I guess she liked my work. But it wasn't being a police person at all about her novel. And the same goes for Mohsin Hamid. Uh, they love the medium of cinema and they, ex they, they, they intended and, ex and sort of expected that their book would be taken into the realm of cinema, which is different. I, I think I, I, I was lucky because I, I worked with Anthony and Saul Zanz when the script was being written. We met three or four times. And um, it, some things became very clear. I mean, there was a whole section in the book where the character of Kirpal Singh is trained to be a bomb disposal person. But as Anthony said, well, we don't really need that. I mean, I love that section. But he said, we don't really need that. We know he's alive by the time he gets to Italy. So he did not die in training. So stuff like that became you know, much simpler. You leave out 25 pages right there. Um, Nicholas and Amy, you of course adapted your own books for the screen. So you were both, unlike in Michael and Mira's case, you, you know, you wrote the novels and then you adapted them to screen. How was it different? Was it like rewriting the book all over again, Amy? I knew nothing about creating a movie or what went into it. I was very lucky to have a co-screenwriter named Ron Bass. And we, he very early on let me know that what we had to do was find the heart and the soul of the book and then create a new narrative that fill, uh, fit a film form, uh, that, it, that art form. And um, they somehow got me to be part of that. And uh, so I got, I got to write uh, these these scenes with them, but uh, it was very different. I thought I, I had seen a play done of, of the Joylet Club that I thought was not that successful because the person, the playwright, tried to be too faithful to the book, include everything, and it made it massively, you know, the bulky and uh, you know, it, it in effect lost some of its power. So I really agreed that it had to be its own form um, to the point where I. I said to the director and the co-screenwriter, you know, we should take this out. And they were more attached to these scenes than I was. And I would look at the pro prologue and I'd say, these are just words, we don't need that. And they would say, are you kidding? This motif is the heart of the movie. So we were looking at this in terms of that. I was very disrespectful of my book and um, they were much more so. Nicholas, how was it for you? Well, it struck me that the difference between a, a novel and a film in many ways is the difference between a donkey and a carrot. They bore no resemblance to one another at all. And Nicholas, will you speak a little bit more? I'll speak a little bit more, yes. Yeah. Donkeys and carrots is what I thought the co combination was. Um, when John Malkovich wanted to make a film of a novel I'd written set in Peru about the... Uh, revolutionary insurgency. He, he, I think he, he wanted to do it because he'd once sat in the cafe where there was a blackout in the novel. And he wanted to recreate what he said 
was a sense of loss in the central character, which is an abstract emotion. And so when I went down to see him um, to discuss what, how we were going to do this, I, I, I've never adapted um, or written a screenplay before, he was very helpful and he didn't want the central character, who's an English journalist, he, a kind of Marlowe figure in the heart of darkness, kind of deliberately mimicking him, who was the waiter to the story, who, who got the reader into the shirt sleeves and the, the guts of the, of the story. He said the camera could do that and that we could get rid of the central character for the novel. And so the camera became the waiter and that was fine. He knew what he wanted and I was his, his um, servant to do that. And I enormously enjoyed trying to interpret his desire for the, for the book. And, and, and I realized that the screenwriter has access to things like music and silence, which the novelist doesn't. The novelist can't use music. I mean, I did have Frank Sinatra singing um, through the novel, but that was too expensive, it turned out, to have in the film, so we had to use Nina Simone instead. But I think the, the novelist doesn't have access to the, the blank page, so to speak, which is the silence uh, of the director. I mean, you, you can have a moment in which um, the camera's on the face of Javier Bardem, an amazing actor, and no novelist can really write what Bardem is doing in that moment. That's where it struck me the great difference was. Tom, you're the professional screenplay writer among this group. You've actually uh, worked on both your, your own books, I mean, and, and, and sort of famous novels. What's, in your view, what's the sort of 101 of screenplay adaptation? What, what's the first thing you have to do before you can take Russia House, the novel, and turn it into a successful film? Well, you, you mentioned titles by John Le Carre, uh, Ed Doctorow, uh, Robert Harris, uh, who wrote Enigma, and Ford Maddox Ford. And while, while you were telling the audience some of the things I've done, uh, it, it came to me immediately that they aren't all the same thing, these titles. Uh, for um, Parade's End, which is a big fat trilogy with a coda by Ford Maddox Ford, um, I had five hours of screen time. And with the other books, I had maybe either side of two hours. And that completely subverts any attempt to, to make a unifying declaration about adapting a work onto the screen. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I have an actor's son who was in a two-hour version of Bride's Head Revisited. Uh, bless their hearts, and his especially. No, <laughs> no. Bride's Head Revisited, the first time I saw it, was 12 hours of screen time. Um, the last film I actually did, uh, sort of, proper movie from a novel uh, was actually Tolstoy, Anna Karenina. Um, and everything that my, my colleagues here have said chimed one bell or another in the experience of adapting Anna Karenina. Uh, and one's pitched and poised between a moral duty to, as it were, be faithful to the original work and a different kind of duty, which one might call professional, to be the, <clears throat> the handmaiden of the director. And I don't have a problem with that, because nobody's ever done it to a book by me. So I've always been the victimizer. I've never been the victimized. <laughs> and I think it's very generous. I think you're very generous the way you spoke about the people who made movies of your books. Uh, because I think um, my tendency would be um, a little more defensive, perhaps, a bit more protective to the film's loss. There's a complicated journey for you too. Um, I want to pull back and, and, and go back to how Michael began, which is with something that Walter Murch had told him. Uh, and Murch said, 
that it's easier to adapt a short story into a film, that novels have too much, they have too much abundance, uh, and that you have to uh, essentialize the novel, cut it down really short uh, in its kind of bare essence before you can turn it into a film. Do you guys agree? And, and, and I remember having this conversation with someone who said, you know, novels make great TV shows and short stories make great films in the world of adaptations. Do you on the whole agree, Nicholas? Do you think that in your experience as a, a, a writer, a critic, uh, a watcher of films, that the best adaptations are really from short stories? Well, it, it's quite odd how very few of my favorite novels ever make very good films. I, I mean, I was trying to think, uh, the, the English Patient is an exception. I think it's a fantastic novel and a brilliant film. And as Michael says, he, he, the, the screenwriter unscrambled the chronology for the script to make it so. Um, I think The Leopard is a marvelous, marvelous film of a marvelous novel, but slightly two different creatures. Yeah. Um, but I can count on only probably the fingers of two hands the, the great novels that I admire and respect and the great films that have been made of them. And I, I don't really have an answer as to why they don't merge more often. Mira, you're the filmmaker. Do you because have any Because clearly views? you haven't seen enough films. <laughs> I haven't seen enough of your films. Exactly. <laughs> um, well... In the case of The Reluctant Fundamentalist, Mohsin Hamid's book, which is really a Camus-like, you know, a monologue of one man, a lover of America, he says, a young Pakistani who's in a cafe speaking to an American, and Mohsin gives us many hints who that American might be. But for a film, you have to have the American be a flesh and blood character. You have to have that person ask questions or engage in an actual dialogue with the you know, protagonist of the novel. So in the case of The Reluctant Fundamentalist, I actually asked Mohsin to write the screenplay. And we worked for three years inventing the American character and inventing actually the flesh of the, of the book. Uh, and then went to uh, Bill Wheeler, who was a pretty extraordinary writer in Los Angeles, to help us really create that sense of thriller and that sense of suspense. Um, so there is a lot of invention that has to happen, you know, when you're making a screenplay of a novel, uh, in, uh, equal to the point of view with which you're treating that story, like in the case of The Namesake. Um, in The Namesake, I had the most wonderful sc screenwriter in Suni Tara Porvala, my very close collaborator and friend, who had loved the novel equally and who, who just had to accept from me that it was going to be about the parents more than the son. But we invented a small things and large things because Jhumpa, as you may know, grew up in Rhode Island. She did not grow up in Kolkata like I did and in India, you know. So we, was, we would embellish things that she had written about Calcutta in a way that she herself would not know. A small example being when, when Oshima comes to be looked at by her, the proposed intended and the parents, you know, parade her. In, in the film, she recites Wordsworth's The Daffodils, you know, in a true Loreto College convent, you know, elocution style, you know, and Jupa was just marveling at that little thing, you know, because she didn't, she knew about an arranged marriage sort of set up, but she would not know the, the poets that we would have been taught as kids in Calcutta, for instance. You know, things like that, that make the thing breathe and feel like it's really off the soil. So there is a constant dance between the novel and the cinema that you want to make of the novel. Tom, uh, as you look back on the films you've sort of helped adapt from, you know, from novel to screen, uh, are there some that you don't think worked? I mean, are you allowed to say, are you allowed to play favorites and say, you know, off my body of adaptations, this one really did sing when it came on screen, and this one actually didn't live? Um, do you mean movies uh, which I've worked on or have my name on, which haven't worked? Uh, so, which, so one, which one <laughs> did, by the way? <laughs> No, I mean, you made loads of, I mean, Russia House, Enigma, Anna Karenina, all fantastic. All I mean is, and I'm sort of slightly putting you on the spot here, but is there one that you said, 
now in retrospect, oh, I'm not sure that this, this is, as, uh, if, you know, as a man who is, a, is a, that this is a successful adaptation, now that I look back on it. Is there one, or do you think, no, they've all worked? Uh, they, uh, the, the, I think, you know, my colleagues will understand this in the right spirit. They all disappoint. And <laughs> the ones, uh, 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 when I say that the right spirit, I mean, that there's bound to be some shortfall somewhere. You might think this is really actually collected a really good movie and you have no problems with it. But it can then be at the expense of some um, underlying central thought in the book itself. You know, you can, a movie is so utterly different. I think it's rather sort of a bit of a miracle when, when, when the two, as it were, become equivalent in a productive way. I, I think there's a, there's a strange, strangely interesting case history in <clears throat> the movies which are undoubtedly great, which don't have a book behind them, and you wonder what the difference is. You know, nobody wrote a book called Citizen Kane. And curiously enough, and even more instructively for us, Nobody wrote a book called The Third Man until after the movie was written when Graham Greene novelized it. And you look at the two things and you think, you know, what is there to be learned here? And uh, it's quite hard to figure out what there is to be learned here. And in the end, uh, I feel slightly displaced in the world of film and by extension on this panel because I've always been text driven I've never considered myself to be a natural cinema writer, and over the years I've worked on cinema, I've personally, rather painfully, had to learn what it means to write for the cinema. And uh, one, of the, one of the really illuminating moments in my cinema life was realizing <coughs> that the line I would most like to have written in all the films I'd ever seen was actually the line, I don't care. It happens to be a line uttered by Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive. Uh, I'll have to explain in 30 seconds why this penny dropped. Um, Harrison Ford is on the run falsely accused of having murdered his wife. Tommy Lee Jones is the cop. He finally catches up with Harrison, and Harrison's got no way to go because his back is against, the, as it were, a precipice. And the only thing he can do is turn to his pursuer and say with a terrible urgency, I didn't kill my wife. And the policeman says, I don't care. And you suddenly, and you sort of get in one what is actually, what it means to be a cop. Um, okay, that's, I, I think I've had my turn and then some. Chika, can I say something? Yes, please, Michael. I, I think what's interesting is that the different stages of adapting a book to a film. You know, Anthony Mike, can I ask you to... Close him? Yes. So that many stages, Anthony Minghella wrote the screenplay, then he directed the film, which is a completely different kettle of fish, and then the editor takes it another step further, and he, he can even restructure the whole film in the editing stage. So there are three or four stages of adapting a film, and, and you know, there are things that happen in the almost eventual film that don't work out. For instance, the original screenplay of The English Patient ended the way the book did with the the bombing of Hiroshima and Kirpal Singh's fury at it. But when they watched the assembly of it, it was like someone had put the wrong reel into the, into the thing because suddenly we hadn't talked about Hiroshima all through the film and suddenly that comes into the story. And whereas in a book, that can occur. In a film, you cannot suddenly jump 3,000 miles away and bring that as part of the moral element into the story. So that had to be shifted around and recut and so forth. So that kind of different staging of a adaptation, as you probably realize as a filmmaker, 
is, is very, very pertinent. It's not just book to film, it's book to shooting, to editing, and probably audience response. So in, a, in, a, it's in an interesting way, you know, adaptation is almost not the right word, it's inspiration, that by the time a film's made, uh, the source of, the, of that film, whether it's a great novel or an original screenplay, um, is, is a kind of distant sun emanating a certain kind of light onto this film, but it's not a kind of direct, you know, to expect a direct kind of mirror re reflection relationship is a false relationship. And, and also there, there's so many subliminal tricks in editing, or, you know, that I, I could witness. Um, for instance, I remember Walter Murch saying, if the camera stays on someone's face for an extra two seconds after he said something, the man is obviously lying. Otherwise, otherwise, why would the camera stay on his face that extra bit? You know, and he pointed this out to me, and you, you look at a movie like Stagecoach, when the banker says something, the camera does stay on his face left for three seconds. So he, he is obviously lying. So all these little subliminal elements in filmmaking are so far away from the act of writing that it, it is this donkey and horse, or house, would you say? I said carrots. <laughs> carrots. <laughs> Amy and Nicholas, when you saw the film versions of your book, did you think, gosh, there were things in, in the book that I didn't quite see that the films brought out? I mean, is there a way when you faced it, you faced it as a sort of, uh, you didn't quite see it as your own work, you saw it as another work, and then it made you, what was it, because of, the, of everyone on this panel, you sort of both adapted the book into a film. Um, and then saw the film? Well, I think I, I protected myself by thinking it was never going to be made because people who ring up and say they want to make movies of your books never make them. So I thought, well, why don't I ask to write the screenplay because they have to play the screenwriter. And miraculously, John Malkovich said, okay. And so in desperation, because I, as I say, I knew exceptionally little about film and even less about John Malkovich. I went and saw two or three people in the film world who gave me some advice. One of them was a legendary director called Fred Zinnemann, who had written to me saying he would love to make a movie of, uh, of this novel. This would be the one film left he'd like to do. And because Malkovich had already bought the screenwriters, I went to see Zinnemann. And he said very politely, and he had done From Here to Eternity and High Noon, I mean, um, he said, just be faithful to one or two images. Um, th there was a, a scene of the, the terrorist leader, the revolutionary leader, in a cage in a kind of Mickey Mouse striped uniform after he'd been captured on a boat. And there was also a scene of the ballerina who had protected him being condemned to a cell without light. And he said, dwell on those two images. Um, I then went to see a, a completely different um, film advisor called Richard Curtis, who was a friend of mine who wrote three, Four Weddings and a Funeral and Love Actually, and he gave me these two bits of advice. Never make a scene longer than three pages, um, and make sure that you know that every single sentence in your screenplay is going to be listened to by a hundred technicians who have far better things to do. So he was advising you not to get too baggy in, in, your, in your scenes, which in a novel you can do. And a novel can have chapters that are 30 pages. And then I went to finally to see Mordecai Richler, who had written a marvelous film called The Room at the Top. And he said, the secret of screenwrite plays is in the stage directions. And he had written in the, um, his stage directions from The Room at the Top about Lawrence Harvey crossing the room in squeaking shoes. So I put that into my um, arsenal of things to, to, to bring to a screenplay. A lot of squeaking shoes. Amy, I, I want to ask you really the same question, which is that, um, did you feel, when you saw the film of Joy Luck Club, did you think, oh, that's my book? Or did you think, oh, this is something, this is a creature all by itself? No, I, I definitely thought it was my book, you know, because we were looking at the heart of it. We also had something very um, rare, which is total creative control. Um, and we were allowed to make the movie we wanted to and finally found a, co a company, a producer, that allowed us to do that, which was Jeffrey Katzenberg at uh, Disney. 
And uh, so everything that we wanted in the film was there. Um, I think I was most worried about how my mother would see the movie because a lot of these scenes derive from her life. And um, of all the people who were in the audience, she was, I think, the only one who didn't cry. And she said to me later that, uh, you know, uh, real life it was worse and the movie was already a lot better. So um, I do have to say, you know, I'm not a filmmaker at all and I, I don't watch movies that often, but I, I want to say something about Tom's work. I just happened to see this movie on the airplane and I'd seen it years ago. It was Empire of the Sun. And you wrote the screenplay for that. Oftentimes, yeah, when I was learning to write this screenplay with co-screenwriter -screen Ron Bass, um, you know, I was told one of the things you have to do is eliminate a lot of dialogue that's not necessary. And, and again, it was things like, you have 90 seconds. He, they seem to know, you have 90 seconds to do 30 seconds, two minutes. And so the, you, you really have to be careful. But in this movie, there's a little kid with verbal diarrhea. He's an ADHD kid who is, he just keeps talking. He, he can't stop talking, and much to the irritation of a lot of people. But in that, it's not explaining the story. It unfolds the character of Shanghai during that period. And the kind of, you know, the, the Shanghai before the war, Shanghai during that time during survival. And there was a character in that that said essentially what you were saying, I don't care. That was John Malkovich playing the role of like a Fagin. You have somebody, all this trauma going on, and he essentially said, I don't care. I just want to say kudos to you because it's so powerful. At the very end, the kid who has been jabbering away, giving us the character of all the survivors in Shanghai before and after, he goes silent. When he is finally rescued and reunited, he is absolutely silent. That was so powerful. So powerful. Well done. <laughs> Uh, well done, Stephen, isn't it? Um, I learned at least uh, a couple of things I can think of now from working with him. Uh, you know, Stephen always likes to have more than one point of view on the script, and anybody is liable to. What am I doing wrong? Again. <clears throat> I'm speaking as loud as I can, actually. Uh, is that all right? Better? Um, a couple of, I, d I did learn several things from that very film. Um, uh, a, g a guy who kind of hung in with Stephen and the script for a little while, uh, <clears throat> he made two very important contributions to the movie. And I know they were important because I was told this by the, by the producer later. <clears throat> he contributed <clears throat> a leather jacket for the boy and a crew cut for the boy. And this, especially the haircut, was extremely eloquent. The boy forms a relationship with an American uh, in, in time of war. So without going into the ins and outs, there were two really genuine pluses. Um, in another part of the film, the boy f uh, launches a, a toy aeroplane, a glider, a paper glider, balsa wood. And we were shooting this. And I remember saying to the producer again, he was saying, take after take after take. And basically, I, I was thinking, what on earth was Stephen doing, um, using up all this time on what really can't be a lot of screen time because the paper airplanes don't fly forever. But when you actually saw his cut, the plane just went on and on and on beyond any kind of realism. So. I was always a step behind, not a step ahead. And these are the components, these sorts of things, a haircut, a kind of unreal realism about how long a plane can stay in the air. These sorts of things are the
kind of unanalyzable necessities of a complete and successful work of art. And uh, in a way, our being writers, manipulators of the word and creators of the utterance, we're not necessarily the most important people to ask about how to turn a novel into a movie. All right? I agree completely. Mira, what do you think as, as the creator, as the person who sort of makes those decisions Tom's been talking about? Well, as someone who loves books and loves the written word, there's one thing uh, that movies do elliptically and with greater economy and with an instant sense um, that, you know, is nostalgia, for instance. You know, that you can write dreams about what it's like to be in one place and think about another, and it's very effective. But in filmic terms, it can, it's very economic. You know, how you can look outside your window in New York City, and instead of the Hudson River, you cut to a garden in Kampala somewhere, you know, and you, and it was a namesake, for instance. It was not just a story of living between worlds. A lot of people can make that story, but when I saw the commonality between Kolkata and New York City through its bridges, through its literally the Howrah Bridge, the Queensboro Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, the fact that politics, uh, you know, is, is graffitied on both places, and just the commonality visually, you know, and using that to really get into the state of being of Ashima and Ashok. So she's giving birth in, in New York and outside her bridge, outside her window in the hospital is actually Queensboro, but Queensboro morphs into the Howrah, you know, and she's actually longing for her home and her mother to be there as she gives birth. But you can do this in a very economic, very distilled fashion in movies. It, and, you know, it takes less than five seconds to get into that subliminal state of, in this case, as an example, nostalgia or longing, you know, exile. These are things that films and, and images do very poignantly that literature helps us to understand, but films take you there in a way that you can almost have the fragrance of the other place. Um, so that's one thing. Well, I, I think one of the things that, uh, I, mean, I, I did not want to be involved with filmmaking. I did these documentaries earlier on, but I, I knew once I was in the film world, I, I was a writer and not a, a filmmaker. But so Anthony and I had lots of discussions, and you know, I, I love the craft of any, any, any art. And he would say, for instance, Kip appears two thirds of the way through the book in The English Patient, and he's got to appear earlier on. So there's a small scene after about 15 minutes where Hannah sees him working on some bomb disposal thing. And, he, and then, so when he comes in later on as, the main, as a main character, he's been set up. So I agree with him. And then in my next book, Anil's Ghost, I had a doctor called Garmini who appeared two thirds of the way through. All my real heroes appeared two thirds of the way through. And I thought, okay, so I have him now in that in the rewrite of the book, had him appear early on as a minor character in a scene. So I think writers can learn from filmmakers as much as the other way around. But certainly filmmakers have so many rules that seem to be essential. I mean, Anthony said, you know, you can only have one person having a flashback in a film. In, in your book, everyone has a flashback. So there was only one flashback for the patient. So I think... I'm going to now open it up to questions. Uh, I know there'll be many, there are many hands up. Can we have, there's a lady here in black. Um, hello, I'm, uh, my question. Uh, hello. Hello, yeah. Thank you for this amazing, enriching session. My question is for uh, Mr. Tom Stoppard, sir. So you'll have to forgive my ignorance. I'm only a first year undergraduate student of English honors. So uh, my question was, um, I recently read Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and I've watched Paris then and Shakespeare in Love. So I would just like to ask you, um, what are the ways in which you think it would be uh, adapting a film 
adapting a novel into a screenplay and adapting a, uh, a play into a screenplay would be different? And what do you think lends itself to the cinematic medium more organically? As in, you worked out, worked with Ford Maddox Ford's novels, and you worked, uh, I don't know if you adapted a play into a movie though, so like, what, would be, uh, what would you think is the primary difference between these two mediums, and what would you think is easier or more organic? Um, uh, I'm just gonna summarize for you, if you can just like nod and say I've got it right. What's the difference between adapting a play into a screenplay and a novel into a screenplay? Between them, that and what, and what's the so that's it, right? Uh, it's a cinematic medium. So, so how? Yeah. So you know, when you when you adapted <laughs> Rosencrantz, the play into a screenplay, and when you adapted, say, Anna Karenina into a screenplay, so a novel into a screenplay and a play into a screenplay, are they different? Is one harder than the other? The main difference is I never wrote Anna Karenina. In the case of Rosencrantz, I, I was the one person who was willing to, as it were, undermine or subvert the existing text. Um, I think that um, the idea of there, there, there being a kind of one-size-fits-all answer to most questions is a difficult one. As a matter of fact, this is a bit of a tangent, forgive me, but I, I don't like to hear that it's somehow a good thing not to let a scene run to more than three pages. I don't like to hear that it's actually a sort of rule or a helpful notion that a speech shouldn't be more than four lines or whatever, because that suggests to me a kind of risk-free filmmaking and it'll probably you know, keep you out of trouble, out of the abyss, but uh, the things we actually respond to which feel transcendent are on the whole rule-breaking moments. And you see a film where a scene goes on and on and on and it doesn't stop. And I'm not talk, trying to make a distinction between art film and popular film. Uh, what was that film with was it Pacino and Robert De Niro who, uh, Heat, was it called Heat? Yeah. And this dialogue, uh, cut, 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 cut. I won't go on about this. I just think that, that one shouldn't feel that there's a, a kind of format to be conformed to. So whether you're doing Anna Karenina or doing your own play, uh, every moment is a kind of challenge in itself. You, you, you live in the moment as an adapter, as in anything else in life. Thank you. I mean, in the, in the middle. So my question is rather a general one and it's open to all the panelists. So whoever wants to respond can respond. Uh, my question is, do you think there's some sort of pride in literature and a prejudice against adaptations? So, whoever wants to answer, thank you. So, is there, it's a, it's a cleverly worded question, is there pride in uh, filmmaking and prejudice, original screenplays, and prejudice among uh, off adaptations? Mira, I mean, you're the filmmaker. Do you think there's an, there's basically, do you feel that people think adaptations are a kind of lesser being than, than, the, than the original screenplay? No, I mean, of course, there is a certain delight in an original screenplay uh, because of a, a complete freedom in trying to make what you want, you know, but I have the same attitude about, you know, uh, adapting or working with a writer to adapt because ultimately what I'm doing is making a film that should work or must work. So I will give the same love and the same idiosyncrasy, in fact, to uh, a screenplay from either a text or of its original. So I don't, uh, but there is, of course, in terms of achieving something, I know in making Monsoon Wedding, for instance, 
I mean, Sabrina Dhawan wrote a beautiful original screenplay that I hoped made better and better as we filmed. But um, it's lovely that it came out of our lives and our memories and our families and our pain and our darkness. It's a lovely feeling to have done something that is original. But it's the same kind of thing for me to treat, uh, 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 to treat. You know, uh, uh, Jumpa used to call me the mother of the namesake. You know, like she, she. She created it and I sort of shepherded it into another state of being, another state of, from childhood to something else, you know? So it's the same treatment for me, but maybe the writers would feel differently. Yeah, I don't have any prejudice against adaptations. Um, when I was about 15 in Sri Lanka, I saw the film Scaramouche and it changed my life. I was besotted. Also, the writers make a whole lot of money when it goes to film. <laughs> Should we, should we go to the back left, somewhere around there? Yeah, sure. Uh, my question is for uh, Meera. Uh, freedom in adaptation. How much a director or a writer can take of freedom in adaptation while concerning time, place and an action? So I, if I have it right, uh, so just nod if I've got it right. Uh, does a uh, director feel constrained sometimes by the fact that there is this novel in the background? Uh, do they feel completely free psychologically to adapt a novel in a way, I mean, to do what they want with a novel in the way that they might with an original screenplay? Is that fair? Is that I have to say that I do feel, I mean, while I love making the author happy in some way and retaining the essence or spirit of the novel, I do also feel free because in the case of The Reluctant Fundamentalist, there was a supporting role, a smaller character of the woman that the protagonist falls in love with, a sort of elegaic kind of personality who literally walks into the water and disappears and giving, gives up on life. And I could not make a female character that gave up on life. I just would not be able to create that person and I would not be able to live with that person for two years, which is usually what it takes to make a film. So we converted the person who was this sort of mysterious, depressed, melancholic soul into an artist uh, who is much crazier and much more dealing with interpreting uh, you know, the world that uh, our protagonist comes from. It's a character I've met all over the world and I wanted to try and, you know, use her in that way, uh, much more complicated. And uh, so, yes, I mean, I, I, I didn't ask Mohsin's permission, but I think he accepted it uh, sort of sweetly. <laughs> so, uh, up front. Hello, um, I'm Max. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I just wanted to know what um, your favorite uh, adaptation was. Nicholas. Amy, do you want to go first? <laughs> well, I, I think of a modern novel, it's Michael Ondaatje's The English Patient. Uh, I, I am just so impressed by it. And it, 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 re it returns the, the, the viewer to what cinema um, is and can be and should be, which not every film does. Um, I also think that uh, probably my favorite film that has no book behind it at all is Casablanca. I, I see it time and again, and I just think it's a miracle. Um, and when you read how it was made, it becomes even more miraculous. Tom, do you have a favorite adaptation? And it doesn't have to be something you put your pen to. Um, well, Casablanca was an adaptation, was it? It was a play. Yeah, it was a, it was a, Sorry. So that would certainly be one. Um, uh, when, when the questioner stood up, I thought he was asking each of us what our favorite animation by ourselves was. And by the time my brain had rejected this interpretation, <laughs> my mind had become a blank about anybody else's work. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, but um, I'll probably think about it, think of a wonderful example of what I might have said on the stairs as I leave. Thank you. Amy, do, do you have a, do you have a uh, 
a film that you'd like to talk about? Or you? No, I, I have the same problem he has. I thought you were doing my favorite adaptation. I Is mean, I will say, because I happened to have just seen Empire of the Sun, I didn't know you were the person who did that. I just was marveling over every, you, you talked about the plane, you know, the fact that it was dropped. There's so many of these things that led to the change in fate. I do want to say something about film that has something a little bit beyond the screenwriting adaptation part. It's the music. And that what you have in a film that adds to it, the, the dimension of it, that you do not have in a novel is this soundtrack that goes on in the back, the filmic music. If you can get that, what music can do is create motifs that play throughout, and so it can be recollection of memory, and it deepens the scene without having to do much at all, except the, the look of the person and that music. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things about the English patient that I like, the scenes I like most are the ones that are not in the book, that are slightly to the left or the right and create a kind of uh, something where, which I can discover. And just to say that a Swedish filmmaker called Jan Troll, who made great films, um, The Emigrants and The New Land, which are, for me, great adaptations of a really great novel. Mira, what's your favorite adaptation, which aren't your, your wonderful films? <laughs> No, so non Mira and Ira movies. What are, what are films you've loved that have been great adaptations? I, you, this question's put everyone on the spot, I'm afraid. I might have to, to, to open into another question we can maybe end with if they've thought of what their favorite adaptation is. Let's pass on. Uh, often in a class of film studies, we are engaged into debates of authorship, and we are then introduced to passages like Death of an Author, so, well, Stanley Kubrick is one of the most successful directors. Most of his work is adapted. And if not that, everybody else has to be a Quentin Tarantino who will first write his film and then would adapt it. So, what do you think, you know, is authorship limited to the person who wrote it originally or it can extend or it, would, it can transcend as well? What do you think? Um, can I... Um can I uh, re rephrase your question and tell me if I've got it right? Uh, when you see a film adaptation, uh, do you believe that it's the, it's the novelist who's the creator of that story, or do you think it's the novelist and the filmmaker together who've sort of created the yeah, film? I mean is that the right? I who's the, the artist? The, in the that idea movie? of authorship itself is debated by, you know, film, I would say, expert or say film the people who study films critically, the idea of authorship itself. So then there's this passage, Death of an Author by Roland Barthes, and then where we argue and where we debate who actually is the author. Who is really who, so, so who is really the author? Is that what you're saying? Of, of a great adapted film? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, I think we've had answers to that in the, I think Tom, both Michael talked about sort of the layers that go into a film. I think sort of what everyone on this panel, if I'm, if I'm going to speak for them, say that the actual screenplay is just one part. Uh, it, it's, like a, it's like a house being built by bricks, and it's one brick in the house, but there are many other bricks that go into making it. Should we um, do the last question with the girl up front? Yeah? Hi, so my name is Urvi, and uh, Mira, I met you two years ago when you came to Kunur and you helped me before I went to Mount Holyoke. And, uh, and uh, so I just, I met Vicky and Shifali last month. Please ask the question and, and don't said, uh, make uh, me embarrassed, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so what is more challenging for you, adapting a book like The Namesake into a film or making a film like Monsoon Wedding uh, that deals with personal experiences and adventures? Um, I, I really look at whatever I do with the same amount of, uh, um, uh, I hope, clarity and, and heart, you know. Uh, the idea is also to answer the gentleman before, is if you're, the, the, you're making a film, it has to have the layers, the, the uh, three things have to happen at every moment, you know. It's, it's kind of have, it has its own 
intensity in a sense. And um, so I, I give it the same treatment um, uh, of density, of layering, of clarity, of hopefully emotion. Because the greatness of our medium of cinema is that its plasticity, the fact that it encompasses, as, uh, as Tom and others have said, it, it, you know, music and color and the foundation of a great story of performance, it allows for a lot, but you have to distill it to make something that works. So it is the same uh, attitude uh, towards an adaptation uh, as it is towards an original screenplay. You have to make something that works, you know, and that communicates your own intention and emotion to a larger audience. Thank um, you. Am I allowed to ask one more question? No, that's it. I'm really sorry. I know there are some of you who really want to ask that final question. Thank you very much for being such a fabulous audience. Thank and you. And for asking such great questions. Thank you, everyone sitting here on this panel being wonderful. Thank you very much. Please, let's show our appreciation for Amy Tan, Michael Ondaatje.